Okay, today's lesson is about molecular polarity. Um, we'll be able to use molecular polarity to answer the question, why is water in the liquid state at room temperature, but carbon dioxide is a gas? When you think about it, you use water every day, it's essential for life. What is it about that molecule that makes that substance a liquid at room temperature? So carbon dioxide, we're exhaling all the time at room temperature and pressure, it is a gas. So what is it about the carbon dioxide particle that makes it a gas at room temperature? To answer questions like this, we start with the chemical formula, which you use your nomenclature to figure out. And then you use um, your knowledge to draw a Lewis structure. So in the space provided below the CO2 and H2O formulas here, um, pause the video, take a moment, and draw the Lewis structures for CO2 and water. Okay, and so we see the 16 valence electrons of one carbon and two oxygens arranged in this structure, two double bonds between carbon and oxygen atoms. And water, we see the Lewis structure here, eight electrons. Now, when you look to the flow chart up here, we've written the chemical formula, then we drew the Lewis structure. Now we need to consider the bond polarity, so the polarity of these bonds here and over here, as well as the bond symmetry. Together, these two components will determine the molecular polarity. So the whole goal of today's lesson is to be able to determine the molecular polarity. Once we know the molecular polarity, then we can determine the strength of the attractive forces between the particles. IMF stands for intermolecular forces, and that will allow us to explain properties like state or boiling point, solubility, other, other properties. So when we're asked why is water uh, in the liquid state at room temperature, well, we're really being asked to explain as the state of water. That'll be explained, as you might guess, by the strength of the attraction between the particles. If they're in a liquid state, it must be decently strong forces between the particles to hold them in the liquid state. Certainly we'd expect CO2 as a gas to have weaker forces of attraction between the particles. In order to really describe these forces, which will be our next lesson, we need to first be able to state the molecular polarity. And so the question becomes, how does the bond polarity and the bond symmetry in each of these molecules determine the molecular polarity? Okay, so in the Lewis diagram, we can see the arrangement of the valence electrons, the bonding electrons and the non-bonding or lone pairs. But this doesn't tell us the shape of the molecule. Here's a photograph of a CO2 molecule using a model building kit. You'll see the black atom represents the carbon and there are two oxygens um, on either end. These bendy bonds here, you can see represent the double bond here. And if you can tell, there's a second one behind. So this is the same <clears throat> uh, double bond between the carbon and oxygen that we see here. There are no lone pairs around the carbon. So essentially, there are two bonding domains or two areas of electrons, both bonded ar around the carbon. And you can see by the shape that these atoms, red, black, red, end up in line. The shape is linear. And that's because the electrons, the valence electrons, are looking to arrange themselves as far apart from each other as possible in order to minimize repulsion. That then becomes 180 degrees. So in fact, the Lewis structure <clears throat> drawn here of the CO2 molecule is actually also the shape diagram because the molecule is linear. Now in the case of water, we drew the Lewis structure and have two bonding domains and two lone pairs. In order for these valence electrons around the oxygen to minimize repulsion, it actually requires a bond angle here of about 104.5 degrees and you'll see these two lone pairs represented by these um, cloud pieces. So the red atom is the oxygen and we have the two hydrogens. Why are the bonded pairs arranging themselves in this fashion? And perhaps you can get a better look at the 104.5 angle right here. Well, those electrons in these lone pairs here are repelling each other quite strongly and forcing these bonded pairs closer together. 
And so it's actually the presence of the lone pairs that causes the shape of the water molecule to be bent. So that's the key difference here. Without fully formally studying Vesper shape or molecular shape, which we do in grade 12, it's really enough at this point for you to notice that the presence of the lone pairs causes asymmetry in the molecule in terms of the bonding. So here we have bonds that are 180 degrees apart from no matter how you look at it. And here we have lone pairs forcing the bonded pairs closer together. If I was to draw a shape diagram of the water molecule, I would just make sure to show it bent as opposed to the linear of the CO2. So again, we're not formally studying shape here. So for bond polarity, we're going to look at electronegativity difference. And for bond symmetry, we're going to look for lone pairs around the central atom. Okay, so looking at the CO2 molecule, let's first calculate the electronegativity difference of the carbon-oxygen bonds. The fact that they're double bonds doesn't change the fact that you're just subtracting the two electronegativities of the atoms involved in the bond. And so we see oxygen at 3.4 and carbon at 2.6, and so we come up with 0 0.8. So clearly these both are polar covalent bonds. All right, so we have polar bonds. The question is, is the molecule also symmet symmetrical in its bonding? And when you look for the symmetry, look at the central atom and look to see if there are lone pairs. So the fact that there are no lone pairs around the central atom means that, that it's symmetrical. Imagine yourself standing in the middle of two people, one on your left and one on your right, and you're, ho the, you're all holding the tubing that we used in class. The people who are the oxygen on the outside are the partially negative, the more electronegative atoms, and you standing, oops, and you standing in the middle are the partially positive. So the people on either side of you are going to be pulling with an electronegativity equal to that of oxygen, and compared to your pulling, it's leading to uh, a, a direction or a vector of 0 0.8 pulling in either side. But because of the shape of this molecule, because the, there's no lone pairs and it's around the central atom and the symmetry, it means that the you're going to feel an equal but opposite pull. And so the polar bonds together with the symmetry in the shape of the molecule, in the bond symmetry, means that the molecule is overall a nonpolar molecule. So what does it mean to be a nonpolar molecule? Well, there's a symmetrical distribution of charge around this molecule. A symmetrical distribution of charge. Now, water on the other hand has these oxygen-hydrogen bonds, and so the electronegativity difference turns out to be 1.2 as we subtract those electronegativity values. And so yes, there are polar bonds in the water molecule, and we can indicate those with the delta negative and delta positive. Now, as far as the symmetry goes, when you look at your Lewis structure and you notice the lone pairs. When you see lone pairs around the central atom, that means that the molecule is asymmetrical in its bonding. And so polar bonds together with asymmetry in the, in the bonding means that the molecule is polar. So we have a polar molecule with an uneven distribution of charge throughout the molecule. And so that means that other molecules are going to interact with water through, or polar molecules, through dipole-dipole attractions, or perhaps even hydrogen bonding, as it would be in water's case, with the idea that one end of this molecule is going to view as positive, partially positive, to a neighboring particle, right? And one end will view as partially negative. Whereas in the case of CO2, there's no particularly negative or positive region of the molecule. So 
there's an isotope, sorry, there's a FET simulation of molecular polarity that allows you to play with, so alter the electronegativities of the atoms involved in the molecule. And in playing with those electronegativities, it, um, you'll see changes to the polarity of the bonds and you'll see how that affects the molecular polarity. You will also be able to change the uh, shapes of the molecules. So I highly recommend that you go to the Unit 1 tab of our notebook and find the FET simulation for molecular polarity. I think it's really important to explore that. You'll notice that there's an electric field when you are in that simulation and the idea is that if there, I don't remember in the simulation which end, which plate is positive and which one's negative. Here I've put the negative on the right. But the idea is that a nonpolar molecule will not orient itself in any particular fashion in this electric field. And yet a polar molecule certainly will. The, the partially positive end of the polar molecule will attract towards the negative plate and the partially negative end will definitely orient towards the positive plate. So you will see polar molecules orient themselves in a particular direction due to the partially positive and negative ends of those molecules. Okay, so I've summarized in steps here how I would suggest you determine the molecular polarity. When you study a molecular shape in grade 12, then we will add vectors of the bond dipoles in order to determine the molecular dipole. But for now, we're not studying the shape formally, so draw a Lewis structure and determine the bond polarity, so find the electronegativity difference, and then note the presence of any lone pairs on the central atom or the absence of those lone pairs. If there are lone pairs on the central atom, the molecule is asymmetrical, and if there are no lone pairs, then it's symmetrical. So if you have polar bonds, then if the molecule is symmetrical, the, mo the molecule will be nonpolar. But if you have polar bonds and the molecule is asymmetrical, then like water, you'll see it's a polar molecule. If you only have nonpolar bonds present, it must be a nonpolar molecule. So CH4 is an example of that. It has very weakly polar bonds, but um, you know, essentially 0 0.4, we can consider them nonpolar. If there happens to be only one bond in the molecule, then that bond polarity will determine the molecular polarity. So you see examples here of H2 being a nonpolar molecule and HCl being a polar molecule as determined by the polarity of each bond that's in that molecule. And really the only case that I suppose I haven't covered here then is the idea that, that perhaps the molecule seems to be symmetrical because of the absence of lone pairs around the central atom. So an example of this might be CH3Cl. So noticing that there are no lone pairs here might make us think that this molecule is symmetrical and therefore going to be nonpolar. But in order for it to be truly symmetrical, all the bonded atoms need to be the same. The electronegativity difference here is 0 0.4 for each of these carbon-hydrogen bonds, which are essentially nonpolar. The electronegativity difference for that carbon-chlorine bond is larger. And so it, at 0 0.6, with the chlorine being more electronegative, I've drawn a bond dipole here, this red arrow that's pointing towards the chlorine. For the carbon-hydrogen bonds, they're very small bond dipoles because essentially that bond is so weakly polar. And so we don't have this cancelling out effect. The fact that the carbon-chlorine electronegativity difference is 0 0.6, so that's not the same as the carbon-hydrogen ones, and it's pointing in an opposite direction, means that the bonding here is actually asymmetrical. So the 0 0.6 gives us a polar bond, and even though there are no lone pairs around the carbon, the idea of the bonded atoms not being all identical, so in other words, setting up this different electronegativity difference between carbon and chlorine, that's what's leading to the asymmetry. And so this molecule, whoops, would be considered then a polar molecule. So the key with the symmetry, when you see that the lone 
the there are no lone pairs around the central atom just check to see if all the bonded atoms are the same because if they're not then the molecule will be asymmetrical which is then going to lead you to the conclusion that it is a polar molecule check out the FET simulation and you will notice um, bond dipoles or arrows being drawn I don't recall the colors one of them is black and one of them is yellow but there's little boxes on the side of the simulation and they allow you to you know check like if you check the box it will display the bond dipoles they allow you to show the partially negative and partially positive symbols positive and negative here um, they also allow you to turn the electric field on. I recommend you do that and then play with the scales of the electronegativities for the atoms A, B, and C and, you know, really explore and ask yourself questions. What if I did this? What if I did that? And then as you come up with questions or you notice what's happening, um, bring those conclusions into class and uh, bring your questions in and we'll explore it together.